still missing some, but um, yeah, it's their choice, I guess. Uh, Yannick, if you can hang on at the end, I need to check in with you about your internship. Okay, um, so before we move on, any questions from Friday and the information that we covered Friday? Um, not about the information, but simply just about the test. The pre-chapter pre quiz? Yeah, the quiz. Mm -hmm. Are they graded yet? No, I haven't looked at. I haven't looked at those. I'll look at them this afternoon. So I always go in and double check because Blackboard will, um, like, if you put in a typo, it doesn't recognise it. Or if I put the answer in with a capital letter and you don't use a capital letter, or the other way around, it'll say you've got it wrong when actually you got it right. So yeah, I'll be checking them all this afternoon. In all the classes. <laughs> Okay, so let's move on. Um, we're looking at body composition, and um, on Thursday we'll be talking about measuring comp body composition, which is covered in this chapter, so I won't be covering that in the class. We'll do that on Thursday with the lab numbers that are available in our workbook, okay? Um, so, uh, now we've got to a little bit of the application of this idea of body composition. When we look at physical performance, then for many uh, sport, sporting events, the higher the percentage body fat or fat mass, that someone has, um, then if you have uh, another player who's um, got the same fat-free mass but lower percentage fat mass, then you'll see the person with the higher fat tends to um, have a slightly lower performance, particularly in events that involve airtime. So that's anything where you have to get your body up off the ground. So not so much throwing events, but running and jumping type events. We see um, typically lower performances in people that have higher body fat. Um, and because fat cells don't use oxygen and muscle cells do use oxygen, people with higher body fat percentages have lower um, relative VO2 max. All right. So uh, if we're looking at strength events, then higher fat-free mass is clearly a benefit there. Um, and the Research would say that if we're trying to correlate body composition and physical performance, we have to take into account the measure of body composition that's used and the range that's been examined and the task that's being performed. So what we see in the research is quite interesting because when we, when we run a test, like the fitness test that we're going to do in lab, then that correlation is negative, right? But when we look at performance, it's a much harder picture to tie down 
So in performance, that correlation is much less clear than it is in the actual physical fitness tests. Okay? That's because in performance, there's a lot of other things involved, right? So there are a couple of interesting tables um, in the textbook. One is um, looking at uh, American football players and looking at their body fat percentage correlated to certain tasks. And the other one is looking at soccer players. So those are quite um, interesting tables for you to take a look at if you want to. And also I would recommend that you have a look at the expert view on page 401. Um, about the obesity epidemic. That's, that's a pretty interesting piece, particularly if um, you're going to end up being a teacher of some kind, so a coach, a teacher, a therapist, a personal trainer. Um, there's some very useful tips there from an expert in that field. So um, I would highly recommend that you read that box. It's uh, box 13.2. Um, so, again, you know, remember that what we're trying to soak into our brains, and I don't know about you guys, but, but I was a gymnast, and so everything about was about the scale and what you weighed, and they regularly embarrassed you in front of everybody else on the team, and all kinds of horrible things like that, that make us all completely la-la. Um, so remember, what we're trying to get over here is that we shouldn't be hung up on what is the weight, what is the scale saying. That the body composition is much more important than the weight, and that that body composition is going to vary massively depending upon the sport and the position that you're looking in. Right, so you can see here, obviously a long distance cross country runner doesn't look anything like the football player, right? His body composition is completely different. But even if you take football as a team, within that team, because of the way they divide up to play certain positions, even within a team, you're going to have different body compositions that are more effective in different positions on the team, all right? And so that's, that's an important key to really kind of get over, all right? Um, and if you look at those tables, you'll see that, the, for example, for the, um, the American football players, that the correlation between their fat mass and their sprint times is significantly negative, right? So with, with their higher fat mass, their sprint times are not very good. But if you look at their bench press, then the picture is very different, right? And, um, one of the things that's coming up in the chapter, which we're going to cover a bit later in the semester in lab again, um, it's a new piece in the chapter, and the lab that we do this work in is way down in the semester. So I will just transfer that piece of information to the lab. Um, but if you look on page 405, they start talking about body somatotyping. And somatotyping is looking at the size and the type of body that you have, as opposed to composition that is measuring fat mass, muscle mass, bone mass, if we had that equipment. All right? So remember that composition and size aren't the same thing. Okay? I'm going to put my bits of paper today from over there. Okay. So, this chart, I 
really like this chart because it gives us a good visual of what's healthy and what's not healthy. Okay? When we look at percentage body fat, so you can't be no percent, right? And there are a lot of functions that go on in the body that require fat in order to work effectively, all right? Not the least of which is maintaining your core body temperature. But there are other, you know, if you think about your biology, um, that we have double lipid membranes that are made of fat, right? Hormones are made with the help of fat. So there's lots of functions that, that would not work effectively if, our, if we had no fat, right? So that's not an option. So when we look at the range of what is healthy, on the low end of the range, right, this is low. The minimum percentage body fat required for your body to function effectively, if you are male, is 3 to 5 percent. And as I said, that is on the low end, right? Um, 6 or 7 would be a little bit better. <laughs> All right, and then percentage for the women is 12 to 14. Again, that's on the low end. 14 to 16 would probably be a better uh, number to aim at. All right. So for lean athletes, anywhere from 6 to 13, right, depending on what's their event. Right. For the men, 6 to 13. For the women, 16 to 20. Right, so if you're a coach of a team, this is the column you should be concentrating on with some flexibility, right? And you'll see, we'll talk about that in a minute. For non-athletes, in order to be healthy, adults, this is adults, right? So for a male, somewhere from 14 to 17% is considered healthy and for women, somewhere between 21 and 24 percent body fat is considered healthy, okay? Then we start looking at what's unhealthy, okay? And um, the column really is missing a column, the chart is really missing a column, because we have here unhealthy because we have too much body fat. So for someone who's not an athlete, 18 to 25% for a man is considered unhealthy. And 25 to 31% for a woman is considered unhealthy. But what the chart doesn't show us is that too low is also unhealthy and increases health risks and mortality risks, right? So, as I said, these numbers are really at the low end anyway. So, you know, these numbers and lower would really be considered too lean, right? And that's not healthy. Your body can't function healthily at that level, right? So we actually have two unhealthy columns here, okay? And then our last column is um, percentage body fat that equates to obesity. So for men that is considered to be um, above 25% and for women above 32%. Okay. So we could go back and say, okay, BMI We'll, we'll look at BMI tables and we'll see that a BMI number of such and such makes me overweight and a BMI number of over 30, 30 or over, makes me obese, right? But remember, the problem with BMI, and we'll talk about this more, but the problem with BMI is I calculate BMI by what I weigh on the scale divided by my height squared. Right? Takes absolutely no account of my body composition. 
So as I mentioned last week, when we calculate BMI in lab, many of the athletes are going to find that they fall in the overweight or obese category because of the amount of muscle mass they carry. Muscle is very heavy. Bones are very heavy. Athletes have very strong, dense bones and lots of muscle. So they don't score well, typically, on a BMI chart. Right? So that's why I said last week, you've got to take BMI um, a little bit carefully. I wouldn't use BMI with athletes, period, personally. It's a waste of time. Right? BMI is really an indicator for clinical workers about whether or not they need to investigate someone a bit further. Right? It's a red flag rather than a real measure of anything. physiology book, 
we would tend to just see calorie with a small c, but that isn't technically correct, all right? Just for those of you who are taking AMP with Dr. Barlow at the moment, I want to make sure you know that <laughs> so that he doesn't catch you out there. Okay, so we said that if we manage to spend more calories than we take in, that that would be a loss in body mass, right? If we balance calories in and calories out, we'll maintain body mass. And if we take more calories in than we put out, we will gain body mass. And we also mentioned that the total calorie expenditure, that side of the seesaw where I drew the little person moving, is a combination of metabolic rate, basal or resting, depending on how it's been measured, right? Plus the calorie expenditure of any physical activity you do, including cleaning your teeth, right? Plus the thermic effect of a meal. And this book doesn't concentrate much on the thermic effect of a meal. It depends which textbook um, your professor uses. Some of them make a lot more of that TEM portion. All right? This book, because it's applied, really concentrates on resting metabolic rate and uh, physical activity. All right? So if I can change, remember, that resting metabolic rate or basal metabolic rate is the largest portion of calories spent in a day. Right? We don't actually spend that much calories in moving. Okay. So if I can change resting metabolic rate, even for a short period of time, that would affect my total calorie expenditure and therefore fat loss if that was the goal. Right? So, if I can shift my seesaw, even if I only shift it by a hundred calories a day, right? Hundred calories a day, yeah. That that's a lot of weight in a year, right? Hundred. It's like 10 pounds in a year. So if you don't have a lot to lose, you haven't got to shift that balance by very much. The deficit can be quite small. If I want to lose one pound a week, the deficit needs to be about 500 calories. If I want to lose two pounds a week, it has to be about 1,000 calories. So that's a much bigger ask but it depends on what the goal is, who's the person, what's the goal, how quickly do they need to lose some, right? If they're patient and they want to stay healthy and they're willing to take 10 months, you don't have to shift it by very much, which is a good thing because then you're asking less lifestyle change. So there are a couple of interesting things when we think about energy balance, all right? If we decrease the calories eaten and drunk by too much, right? So if I go on a crash diet, or even if it's not a crash diet, but the calories are very low compared to the amount of training I'm doing, for example, right? Then, one of the things that happens when we restrict calories to the body is the brain goes, hmm, this can't be right. Maybe, maybe we're in trouble. Perhaps we're stuck up a mountain without any food. Why aren't I getting enough calories? Well, okay, so I better look after my person. I'll just slow everything down 
So we don't use so many calories. So that nice big calorie expenditure part of the seesaw gets smaller, right? So if I restrict the calories that I feed the body, the body will cut the amount of calories it spends. So that doesn't achieve the goal, right? The other thing we have to remember that we'll talk about again later in the semester is that carbohydrate is stored with water. So one of the things that happens when we cut carbs, um, we lose weight very quickly, right? Weight, not body composition, right? Because if I cut carbs, then I drop a load of water weight. So, do I weigh less? Yes. Did I change my body composition? No. Okay? So, we'll, as I said, we'll go over that idea more, but it ties in with this idea of energy balance. Any questions? two things. We either want to lose fat mass or we want to gain muscle mass or we want to do a combination of both. Right? So if we want to do that, then we have to pay attention to our seesaw, calories in, calories out, and we have to understand what it is we're trying to achieve. If I'm trying to gain muscle mass, then my calories in have to be higher than my calories out. And I have to do the right training program, otherwise I'm going to gain fat mass, not muscle mass. Right? So the guidelines are typically set up because the majority of people, when they're changing body composition, are trying to lose fat mass. Right? Gaining or losing muscle mass is a little bit more complicated, um, takes longer <laughs> for a start, right? So, first thing that we have to do, because we want to make sure that we um, maintain adequate nutrition for our body, all right? That's important. So, I've got to maintain my hydration, so I have to drink sufficient water. We can't cut out fat, that isn't healthy. We've already said we have to have fat in our body in order to work and be um, physiologically functioning at a healthy level, right? So we can't cut out fat, but we can make better choices of the fats that we eat, okay? And how much of them we eat. We need to minimize empty calories so fats, sugars, alcohol, right, are all calories that don't benefit us from a performance or an exercise point of view, all right? And we don't want to reduce calories too drastically because then resting metabolic rate slows down and that's not beneficial to calorie expenditure. So if we can get a 500 calorie deficit per day, we should lose one pound of fat per week if we do some form of physical activity at the same time. All right? And another thing that's important is that we keep portions relatively small and we eat more often during the day. All right? Only eating two or three times a day or for some of the athletes once or twice a day, does not benefit trying to change body composition. Right? You want to give your body a little bit on a regular basis rather than a lot at one time. Okay? 
And it's really important that we also include physical activity to A, help that calorie expenditure side of the seesaw, and B, to minimize fat-free mass loss, because we're not typically looking to lose muscle, right? Typically what we want to get rid of is stored fat. Um, doo -doo. Okay, so um, if we don't, oh well, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, one of the things that hopefully you looked at was that um, obesity issue in the chapter that I asked you to read on Friday, and that you'll understand that you know, many diets don't work well long term because um, people can't keep them up. They're not fun, they're not very pleasant, right? My sister announced at the weekend that she and her husband weren't eating carbs during the week, um, and, and, but they are eating carbs at the weekend. I said, so, so you're growing all those vegetables in your garden and you're not eating any of them during the week? None of those nice green beans or cabbage or... And she went, oh no, we're eating fruits and vegetables. I said, well then you're eating carbs. Right? So what you mean is you're not eating starchy carbs, right? Like bread and rice and potatoes and pasta. She went, oh yeah, that's what I mean. I said, okay. Um, you know that's not a good plan in the long run, right? She's like, oh no, we're just doing it for January. Okay, all right, I've got to, I've got to clearly do some education with my sister when I go home in the summer because um, I don't think they're looking at the big picture in a proper way, right? But these diets, the keto diet was not created for a normal person, right? The keto diet was created for obese people <laughs> and then some greedy person stole it and now has marketing keto diet rubbish all over everything in the supermarket to persuade everybody to buy it, right? So diets typically don't work in the long run, a diet, remember that the word diet is incorrect in the first place because anything we eat is a diet, okay? Um, so we've got to we've got to think about how much should we eat and and just as an FYI, your book mentions several times that a weight loss diet should be 1,200 to 1,600 calories a day. That's not for an athlete, people. <laughs> right? Don't ask your athletes to eat under 2,000 probably even more than 2,000 calories a day, right? If you want to get any work out of them whatsoever, they need to be eating more than 1,600 calories a day, right? So if we add in exercise, okay, then we get a really good picture of, of changing body composition because we can decrease fat mass using exercise if we decrease our calorie intake or we massively increase our calorie output, right? Even better, we can increase fat-free mass, which is a key point because muscle mass uses energy. And we can decrease our percentage body fat using either of those ideas on their own, or as we said on Friday, right, option number three, don't hit one or other side of the seesaw, touch on both sides a little bit to find your deficit. Right? Now it's difficult to um, adequately measure energy expenditure, right? It takes sophisticated equipment. So if you use an, any kind of watch that tells you how many calories you've used today, 
It's a guesstimate. Depending on the sophistication of the information you gave the computer and the watch, it could be a reasonably good guesstimate or it could be a really bad guesstimate. All right? But it's a guesstimate either way because to do it properly, you have to be in the lab. Okay? But it's going to it's going to depend upon a lot of factors as well. All right? So, who is this person that we're measuring? Is it a great big linebacker or is it a tiny little gymnast? Right? What was the intensity? How hard were they working during the training session? Okay. Which muscles are being engaged? Because the bigger the muscle group, the more energy that will be used. Right? How many sets and repetitions were done? If it's a, um, a hip type program or a weight training program, all right? And what were the length of the rest periods? So all these items play a role in energy expenditure. If you go to, let's see if I can find it for you. If you go to page 415, they give you a nice calculation that you can use for the energy expenditure for walking or running. It's a guesstimate, but it's a relatively easy calculation, and it will give you some idea of the energy, the energy that you've used. Okay. And it's quite useful to play around with that equation because, um, for example, the trail outside of town, at the back of town there behind where the baseball field is. Um, that trail is, a little, the big loop is just about a mile, a little bit more than a mile. So if you do two laps of that very, very fast, do you spend more or less energy than if you do three laps of it a little bit slow? Right? So you can start playing around with what kind of training day do I want to have today. Okay. So the chapter looks at um, comparing aerobic work, so things like walking you know, power walking or running or riding your bike, um, or if you're down in the gym on the Stairmaster or the elliptical, versus uh, resistance work, which could be traditional weightlifting, it could be um, LV's version of a wicked hip program where you have to roll those great big wheels across the field, um, or it could be uh, even using bands or other types of or body weight, all right? So the research suggests that, um, that well, the research looks at um, mostly during training, what's happening calorie-wise, um, but there is some that looks at uh, post-training calorie expenditure. And what, what the research suggests is that if the training session is the same length of time and the same level of intensity, that would result in equivalent energy expenditure and fat metabolism. The careful there is mine, all right? Because you have to be careful when you directly translate research into practical, uh, real-world training sessions. Okay, if you think about a weight training session, then we unless it's a circuit type session where you're not stopping. Okay. Then you're going to do a set, stop for a minute, do another set, 
stop for a minute, put a bit more weight on, do another set, right? And that's how we work in, in a weight room, right? Or we might superset and do one set on, on squats and then go straight to leg curls. But we don't very often go straight back to squat, right? Typically, there's some form of rest period in there when we do resistance work. And that's why I put the careful, because energy expenditure and fat metabolism aren't the same thing, right? So how much energy we use in the aerobic or the resistance, I'm not quibbling. The fat metabolism, though, every time you take that little rest and your heart rate drops down, you're at risk of stopping the work you were doing towards your fat metabolism and then having to reignite it on the next set. This will all make a bit more sense in the next week or so. All right. Now, they both clearly increase calorie expenditure during activity. Of course, that's why we've talked about it helping with our seesaw. All right. They also can increase resting energy expenditure for somewhere up to 48 hours depending upon the length of time and the intensity of the workout. Right? So that's really useful because that means if you go down to the max pack and you do your workout and then you come and sit in class, while you're sitting in class, you'll be using more calories just sitting still than you would have done if you hadn't gone to the max pack first. Okay? So this is very useful to know. All right? Weight training or resistance training, but particularly weight training, is also advantageous because it's going to increase fat-free mass and the more fat mass, the, blah, the more muscle mass I have, the higher my resting metabolic rate is because muscles use energy and fat doesn't. Right? The best thing we can do and the best thing we can persuade our family members, our clients, our school kids, our athletes is that the best way to achieve any kind of change in body composition is to combine right, my diet, my nutritional intake, and my physical activity should be a combination of aerobic and weight training. That's going to have the most impact. And we have a oops, we have a nice study here. Don't do that. There we go. That shows this really well, okay? So in this study, uh, this study was run on men, not women, okay? In this study, they had a, a population of males and they split them into three groups. One, the first group went on a diet, so they just changed their nutritional intake, okay? The second group, went on a diet and did an aerobic program. And the third group went on a diet and did an aerobic program and a resistance program, all right? Now, over t three months, so this study ran for three months, each group, the average loss of fat mass, no, sorry, weight, the average loss of weight for each group was about 20 pounds in three months. Okay, so that's a, that's a good rate of loss, right? One to two pounds a week. Okay. But that was the scale. They all lost about the same weight on the scale. But weight isn't the key. The key is composition. Okay. So when we look at composition, group one, who only changed their nutritional intake, 
lost about 69% fat free, uh, fat mass. Right, so of their 20 pounds, 69% of that 20 pounds was fat. So 31% was probably muscle mass, which isn't a good thing. Right? That's not healthy to lose muscle mass. Group two of their 20 pounds, remember they also did an aerobic program, about 78% of their 20 pounds was fat. So 22% was still probably muscle mass, right? Maybe in their upper body if all they did was go running or biking. Depends on what their aerobic program was, right? The real fun data is group three, right? Also lost 20 pounds, but 97% of that 20 pounds was fat. They lost very little muscle mass, if any. The other 3% was maybe water loss or a mismeasure or, right? So by combining the three variables, right? then we can be relatively certain that the change in weight is due to fat loss, not any other tissue. Right? Even better, we're going to measure fat percentage, so we know it was fat loss, which we'll talk about on Thursday. Questions? every night for five or six nights of the week from the age of 12, 13 until they kicked me out of the gym at 15 was not helpful, <laughs> right? It did not lead to healthy weight loss. It did not lead to healthy eating behaviors, right? They don't, they don't say, oh, you're too fat. Here's a nice program for you to follow. They just go, you're too fat, lose weight. That's not the way to approach it, all right? And that's why the science and the exercise science classes are so important if you want to be a movement teacher. Because you can use the science to help people do this in an appropriate and safe and healthy way. And the weight will stay off long term because you'll tweak their lifestyle. Right? And they won't have to yo-yo diet for the rest of their lives. Okay? So this information is really important to use with anyone that wants to drop fat mass. Right? As I said, dropping muscle mass, adding muscle mass, that's a bit more complicated. It takes longer. Um, but most people, when they say they want to lose weight, mean they want to lose fatness. Okay. And that's the first thing you should point out to them. <laughs> right? is, that's not what, is that really what you mean? That's probably not what you mean. Let's think about what your goal really is. Let's be specific. Okay? I do have office hours this afternoon, so um, if you have any questions that pop up once we've closed up here, I'll be home and opening up office hours in about 20 minutes or so, and you can 
jump in and ask me questions there. All right? Or you could put questions into the discussion board Q&A and I could answer them there and then everybody can see the answers. All right? Okay, well, don't get blown away if you have to be outside this afternoon. Put some weighted boots on or something. And um, I will see you Wednesday.